guys and gals, me, Mudahara, how's it going? Today we gotta talk about something known as Sweet Baby Ink. Now I've been seeing this fly around on the internet for a fair bit, and ladies and gentlemen, it's been all over the internet, blowing up, I've seen it in my comments section, and uh, obviously pertaining to gaming, I wanted to give a chance and actually talk about this a little bit. But before we get into it, I wanted to bring up the sponsor for today's video, me, Mudahar. And not just me, Gamer from Mars, Oompaville, and Chris Collins. I know the weirdest blunt rotation imaginable. We are actually in the skin cream industry now. And I'm not talking about some white labeling stuff that other creators do. No, we're actually working with a manufacturer that has created our own actual proprietary formula. And the reason why we ended up doing the skin care stuff is obviously we're into it, but other skincare brands are 100% some of the most complicated things. No, I'm not buying 60 products to put on my face and following a ritual, okay? This is not American Psycho. And I can say that kind of stuff because I own the goddamn company. Now, ladies and gentlemen, to understand, it is a simple product for people who just want to apply 30 seconds of their time to basically do one pump out of a bottle, apply it to their face, and just get that routine out of the way. So if that interests you, go to our website. I'll link in the description below, gotoneup.com. That said though, ladies and gentlemen, Sweet Baby Ink. Now, of course, this is a steam group that you're seeing right here, Sweet Baby Ink, SBI Detected. And if you look at SBI Detected over here, the reason why we're talking about this company in particular is, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is growing massively. So right now it has 178 thousand followers right now. This is the perfect example of the Streisand effect and I'll get exactly why. If I hit F5, that number grows harder and harder and harder. So to go over the overview here is obviously this company is for letting people know if a game is involved with this company. So obviously I wanted to go exactly and research what is Sweet Baby Inc. So if you go to Sweet Baby Inc, they're founded in 2018 as a narrative development and consultation studio based in Montreal and working around the globe. Our mission is to tell better, more empathetic stories while diversifying and enriching the video game industries. We aim to make games more engaging, more fun, more meaningful, and more inclusive for everyone. So it's one of these narrative consulting firms where basically, you know, writers or game companies, AAA stuff will usually end up going to just so they can get a better idea of how to make their games more diverse or more inclusive, right? You know, adding in characters that are people of color or, you know, multiple different types of, uh, you know, uh, unrepresented uh, minority groups that may exist. That's kind of the general vibe and the mission statement you're getting out of this. However, there were some posts from the actual uh, people associated with this company that are actually against the concept of inclusiveness, but we'll get to it in a bit. So if you look at some of their projects, they've worked on really big stuff like Alan Wake 2, a game I enjoyed. They tell you exactly that they worked on the character arc, voice, and the sensitivity reading. Uh, I wish they could get a little bit more verbose about it, but of course, games like Sable, where they worked on the writing and character voice. And I've seen this game in the market, I've played it a few times uh, on the Steam Deck, actually kind of trying to chew through it. You've got Spider-Man 2, God of War Ragnarok. But obviously I want to look at more of their projects, so if we actually go over here, you can see that they've worked on absolute bangers like this, okay? Yeah, they worked on the script writing, the banter, cutscenes, barks, audio logs, etc. Yeah, the game is crap, but I don't think it's necessarily crap for the uh, writing. I mean, I've seen the Batman dying scene at the end, which is, oh boy, <laughs> Ooh, that's bad. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, I think what I'm getting out of this is that game just sucks because it's a shitty, it's a, it's a crappy live service pile of nonsense. And of course they've worked on the proofreading and additional writing for the crew motor fest. Dog, it's a racing game. What are you doing? Now, obviously, there's a, you know, amount of gamers that don't necessarily enjoy forced diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion in their games, okay? And regardless of what your stance is on that, being pandered to or whatnot, at the end of the day, we're going to be looking at some of the people associated with this company making some rather crass statements that go against the idea of inclusion. Again, inclusion means all of us get along. And we necessarily put everyone inside the big bubble we call a melting pot, and we don't try to exclude anybody regardless of what, regardless of whatever racial, uh, you know, orientation or whatever they have going for them that they can't necessarily control, right? We don't, we don't get born into the world with a character creator. But God, if we did, I'd be looking like my Ark Survival character, okay? Anyways, let's get to the magical fun here. So because this Steam group was made, 
One account, the narrative designer for Sweet Baby Inc. decided to signal boost and cause the Streisand effect, where by actually blowing something up and trying to, uh, you know, uh, push people away from, you actually bring it to more eyes than it initially would have ever been to. So this account says, the Steam Creator Harassment Group, Sweet Baby Inc., detected is led by this person, Cabrutus Rambo. Here's them trying to be slick so they don't get reported. Even with the discriminatory language filed off, the group itself still fails the code of conduct. And of course, they keep saying, hey, report the fuck out of this group. And of course, when their account actually ended up getting protected, uh, they actually said, uh, hey guys, they got my ass. I guess I, I guess a few hundred gamers reported me where they actually ended up getting um, locked on X because, uh, again, some of their uh, posts were, were obviously not cool. It was incitement of actual harassment. Now, obviously, whatever this Steam group is and their disdain for this company, it doesn't necessarily warrant harassment. What they did was basically create a list of games that they found uh, were actually connected to Sweet Baby Inc. Now, some of these were kind of misfires. I think Starfield was listed inside here, but I don't think that has an actual connection. But obviously, games like The Crew Motorfest, anything listed on their website and on Steam, obviously, they put into a list. And the gamers who were interested in this, who wanted to boycott, basically knew what to boycott in this situation, right? And that's generally what it was, right? Like, people did not want any game associated with the writing works that these people were involved in, right? That's pretty much what the general idea was. And again, if we're talking about boycott lists, those are not harassment lists, okay? There was no harassment necessarily from at least what I've researched on this group being directed towards anybody, right? Obviously, people started to dig in to the individuals who worked for Sweet Baby Inc., at least the public-facing figures, when they started to actually get attacked by this company. Based on the actual person tweeting we just read, the, the, the opening salvo seems to have started from these people who wanted a mass reporting of the Steam Group. Now, obviously, I'm not going to sit here and pretend that there isn't a little bit of a uh, political bias in this group to some capacity. In fact, one of the actual posts was real journalists, okay? Ni uh, why the famous gaming media don't see this problem? Your opinion. Because 90% of them are activists of the very woke kind, and from Gamergate, we know they all collude with each other in WhatsApp groups to push narratives and articles and uniforms. The communists have infiltrated most news media and get their narratives from unknown, unseen, dark sources. There are a handful of news sites still fighting back. Daily Wire, PragerU, you can see exactly what, what, what alignment you're kind of getting over here with at least some of these posts. Obviously, not every one of this group is of one alignment, but, you know, I've seen a lot of posts over here that are, uh, <laughs> that are wild, right? Had a nightmare that I was a SBI employee. Makes me wish Freddy Krueger was real. The illness, the fragility, and the smell. Don't even get me started on the smell. Yeah, I understood that reference. Your avatar has pink hair. Just thought I let you know. Yeah, I think, I think I'm getting what I, I, th I think I'm getting what they're putting down here. But again, the games that they were listing over here, uh, if you're actually looking at the store page for the games, they, they obviously pointed out games like Assassin's Creed Valhalla, where they obviously linked it through actual uh, features on their website, for instance, and so on and so forth. So again, they're not recommending any game associated with this company because of its, you know, uh, DEI practices. So without actually listing any hard evidence of, I guess, harassment that this group was doing, what effectively happened was the people, you know, who worked for Sweet Baby Inc. ended up causing the Streisand effect and raising more awareness for this group. So obviously the people that are interested in this, that don't want the DEI practices in their game, know a list, and that's pretty much how Steam curation lists work anyways. Again, it's kind of funny how, like, you claim one side is harassing, but then you also end up doing the mass reporting and, and, and harassing in a way yourself. There's nothing inherently wrong with people compiling a list of games they want to boycott. If a market force wants to boycott products, it's totally well within their rights to do so. Now, when I started this video and I talked about, of course, this is a company that's focusing on inclusion, I think inclusion is great, right? 
But when you're looking at a company like this, where their whole, you know, shtick is that, it's pretty bad when some of the people behind it are making rather uninclusive statements. So let's actually read some of this stuff real quick. So one of the people who works for consulting for Sweet Baby Inc., who uh, is Lego Butts, all right, this individual, uh, known as Maya, for instance, has been making some rather wild posts anyway. So if you actually look at some of their posts, this is from Archive Today, meaning that you can grab this link right here, all right, Alt-Control-Copy, and you can basically just drop that into the, your, your URL bar, and you can actually read these as actual statements right here. Now again, ladies and gentlemen, the reason why I'm showing you these archive posts is to show you that these were actually made. Uh, again, there's a lot of screenshots floating around, and it, whenever I cover topics like this, I always try to get to the absolute source and truth of the matter. So this individual started writing things like, I usually get grossed out when, st when straight, white, rich people kiss, but even I think those two are pretty cute. Now, that's a weird thing to be writing. Again, when it comes to a lot of these diversity firms, it often feels like everyone is totally okay, but anytime you anytime you bring somebody, you know, from the Caucasian side, suddenly it, these suddenly it's okay to demonize one group. I don't think inclusion can exist when people start excluding one group of people. That's just weird. In a perfect world, and again, I know the world isn't perfect. I'm not a fucking naive idiot. I wish we all did get along, right? Obviously, I think inclusion and diversity diversity is great, but it has to be applied equally, and starting to demonize one group and putting up the rest is never going to bring us on a path closer to each other. If anything, all that does is instill division. Anyways, preachiness aside. Then you found this one right here. Pay me to shoot down your white male lead game ideas. Ow! That's, uh, that's cute. That's, that's wild. Now again, these were back in 2014, but when you're talking about, you know, consulting for this kind of stuff, it's not looking good. Then, of course, you had one. I had a nightmare that I was a white male gamer. <laughs> Dude, there's people in war-torn countries right now where that's like that's like that's that's like a good dream. That's like a perfect dream on a somewhat like decent day. <laughs> that man, you live a very privileged, sheltered life if that's the case. So this one is a screenshot. I hate to be rude, but what's the point in talking to you anymore? Me on Twitter. To men every day. <laughs> Seems like this person doesn't like guys that much. 50% of the world is bad. Now, of course, at some point you get some pretty bad posts. And this is one where it's to uh, a Marxist dog aboard all the... Ooh. <laughs> who God's chosen people, I guess. That's, uh... Whoa! That's pretty bad. And, of course, I, I tried to find the actual um, origin point of this, the, the context. Post is unavailable, but it's funny that this tweet was uh, violating X's rules against violent speech. I mean, no shit. And then, of course, what's, what's even wilder is this one right here. Okay, I don't even know if I can read this. At 20, yo, hot shot. No, but the statement when I grow up made me feel like a giant... Ooh, PD... Ooh, PDF font... Ooh. That's bad. Shut up, Jamie. I know I am. And again, I tried to get the context to this, but it seems like the account owner limits whoever can view that wildness. So yeah, these were some of the posts that were made. But of course, one of the mission statements that was posted by an account known as Learning the Law said, we have to look at story and narrative as one of the things that we can innovate on. Like when you bring someone in from a different culture, from a different background, from a different gender, they're going to create something that we haven't seen before. The way we look at demographics is that we go, okay, the majority of our player base is, let's say, a white male. So we're going to make stuff for white males. But if you make something from the perspective of an Asian trans woman, and it's really strong, then it will work for people. People crave new stories. And if you want to innovate, even to stay current, it's not about graphics, it's not about hardware, it's about opening up new perspectives for people. So I explain it as is. It's important to game development to diversify. It's not just part of advocacy or activism, it's going to make your games better. Alex, also, of course, gamers are mostly white guys. If you're making games for white guys, try making games for somebody else. Maybe they'll show up. You know, maybe those people will show up, right? But I think uh, for most people when they're looking at this, it's important that multiple perspective exists, right? A multiple perspective can lead to new game stories that you probably haven't heard of before. But for them to say it's going to make your games better, again, I don't know 
how you're going to sit down and necessarily make the, the gameplay better by, 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 by going down this aspect of forced diversity, forced inclusion, uh, and whatnot. And again, forced inclusion is me just kind of uh, you know, assessing it for myself. It's a little bit bad faith that I say that, but again, generally, it's, it's cool to get different perspectives. Look, some of my favorite games have been characters that I guess these people would call POCs. One of my favorite games is Grand Theft Auto San Andreas, a game that has a black character, a black protagonist, uh, Carl Johnson. It's obviously, you know, that race is designed because it's a game that takes place in 90s, uh, a parody 90s Los Angeles uh, gang-ridden world where obviously it's rife with, you know, uh, African Americans, Hispanics, and obviously that is a world where you start off as a gangster, but Carl opens up as a character that's pretty empathetic towards his family, somebody that wants something better in life. He's proven to be quite intelligent when he can organize entire heists in Las Venturas. Play Grand Theft Auto San Andreas. Great title. And of course, that's just one example of, you know, a diverse uh, or a minority character that isn't shoehorned into a video game, and it's a different perspective that can be offered, right? That's kind of what we're going with. Whatever writing that these people did for games like, you know, uh, the, the Kill the Justice League nonsense that dropped, obviously that's never going to work. But they obviously did work on things like God of War. Uh, they worked on Alan Wake 2, which from what I've played are pretty decent games. Again, I think mileage kind of varies in the situation. But reading those tweets that I did not too long ago, that kind of rhetoric, that kind of discussion only serves to divide people around them. And that's one of the reasons why this boycott is actually occurring and why gamers are not comfortable with a company like this. And it's understandable. So without the context, I can't exactly confirm this story, but when you read things like, I just had a thought about trying this again with the photo of a young white person about to be ripped open, but I'm betting folks would immediately flag it as traumatic, and I'm guessing the image would get taken down before responses accumulated. I feel like these people are plants by like the CIA to just divide us as human beings against each other. Like this kind of shit, who writes this stuff and feels goddamn normal? It's just unhinged. Like what? What are you doing? So some of the other clips that people were linking out was from a GDC talk in 2021. Now you see me representation as innovation. And of course it's a 29 minute video and there's a couple clips in it that kind of uh, struck people out of context a little bit or, or struck people out of, uh, out of the blue. Listen to some of these. Change and something that is locked in place. So something that does not want to change and something that is locked in place. So despite like the changing face of audiences, despite the changing face of conferences like this one, we still look at our core demographics and say, okay, they're white, cis, hetero males. And we cater almost exclusively to them. And the problem is that we don't just cater to them like, you know, here, here's something that we think you'll enjoy. We cater to them the way that we cater to like a picky baby. We feed them the same thing that we know that they love and we keep on feeding it. We're like, here you go, we, you love it. Eat this, eat this, eat this. So that then when they get anything else, they react as a picky baby would, which is be like, oh no, thank you. I do not want this. And we've actually done this so long that what we're doing is creating an entire nation of picky babies. And so this clip right here is kind of wild. Like it's, 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 again, I think the big problem is if you're like a normal person and you look at shit like this, specifically isolating the whole white cis hetero male crowd, which again would probably be like a mass majority of video gamers because yes, back in the day, I'm sure that was the only demographic that started jumping in to a pretty expensive hobby. I mean, gaming, in my opinion, used to be way expensive back in the day. So maybe that was kind of the roots of it. And obviously she's kind of going into this topic like, hey, maybe we catered to them so long that after a while, that's just all they ever wanted. Now, to understand in this situation, right, to, to kind of debunk and discuss this point, um, I, I, I really, I, again, I don't appreciate the idea of like, again, isolating one group of people. Inclusion can never happen when you're excluding one group of people right over here. And I do understand her point right here as well. I remember when GTA 6 was announced and even during the leaks when they had like Lucy as a female character, there was a few people going, ah, is Grand Theft Auto fucking woke now? Do they, do they, got, they got a woman in the game? Uh, women commit crimes? How is that possible? Yeah, uh, let, let me tell you right now, you might not think that a woman can commit a crime, but once you get access to a nine mil in your hand, uh, everyone is a great equalizer, right? That's pretty much how it works. And look, at the end of the day, my whole stance on this is the game isn't out yet. Obviously, if the game comes out and there's a lot of tropes in it that are gonna make you groan, if there's 
constant, you know, parts in GTA 6 where, you know, Jason, the 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 white protagonist is going to be shit on. Like if they have blatant performative talks like that, and we all know what we're talking about with blatant performative stuff, right? Like if they're generally going to shit on him, make him like a total complete dumbass imbecile while Lucia is basically running the entire show, they specifically constantly reference that she is the more intellectual of the other one and this guy is basically dependent on her and he basically, you know, bends over backward for this. Yes, we can all pretty much say that that's a shitty written script, but until the game comes out, nobody has any idea of the situation. Anybody that does offer the overreaction, I think most of the gaming society definitely like makes fun of them and criticizes them, rightfully so. I get what she's trying to say, but again, it all falls flat when you're actually excluding people as an inclusive company. Like you're supposed to bring people together and that includes the people that the gaming industry was, I guess, initially catering to. It's okay to have diversity and inclusion and shit like that, but constantly doing and having these talks is not good. I cannot take you seriously as an inclusive company when you're actually excluding a group of people off the bat. And there's like a dozen other answers that are all like variations on those themes, but kind of like, a pseudo fun fact about me, that's slightly fun, is that I actually have a marketing degree. And so I want to put on that like, to completely go like, just give up, we've, <laughs> we've screwed it. Um, but I think it's still amazing that I can be seated in a meeting and told that out of 12 characters, we already have one black one, so there can't possibly be a second. <laughs> I get that way too much. And I once worked on a project where they had an all white cast and they expressed their desire like, okay, we need to mix it up a bit. How about this character is kind of like stereotypically French? So they have a beret and they have like a striped shirt. <laughs> and I was like, okay, if you need to do that, can we at least make them a person of color? And they said, oh no, that would be weird. They're already French. <laughs> so I want to do better than this. <laughs> See, the whole idea, and I, I, the whole idea isn't about like, oh, let's make that character, uh, uh, let's make that, uh, let's make that a uh, character like a different race or something. Uh, I think the idea was that she was trying to counter the person that was going like, bro, but they're French. French people are just supposed to be whites anyways, right? Especially in like 2024, it's also another melting pot society. There's French people that look like me. They, t they talk in French, but they look like me. I think, I think what she should be hammering is if you want to talk about good fucking writing, probably don't write a stereotypical French character that would be out of Looney Tunes back in the day, okay? With the beret and the cigar in their mouth. Dog, Nostalgia Critic made this joke over a decade ago. And again, to elaborate on this point, uh, I, I really do believe that when I, I talk about, like, obviously uh, a good, well-written character, obviously her example of the French character Clearly, you know, that was a stereotypical character, you know, wear a beret, smoke, eat a baguette. And I'm sure everyone can laugh at that. But when I think of a well-written character, no matter what their nationality is, no matter what their, uh, you know, um, uh, racial background is, you know, as an Indian person, would I love to see an Indian character represented in a modern, you know, AAA game? Sure, absolutely. Who wouldn't, right? Like, you know, that would be fun to see. But I'm more interested in a well-written character. I don't like, obviously you know, seeing myself represented just for the sake of diversity. Obviously, that is that level of pandering only serves to infuriate people like me and everyone around us. And it doesn't really give gaming that mature look that it needs. Now, when I say well-written, well-meaning characters, I really do mean characters that have depth to them. Going back to that CJ example that I had with San Andreas or Samus Aran, characters that have actual intrinsic characteristics or sorry, characteristics of their personality, of their humanity, that is more than just what they're born with, right? I think in reality land, people are more than the sum of their intrinsic characters, right? As an Indian person who was raised in Canada, my life experiences, my culture, my beliefs, what happens when my synapses fire are different than another Indian person out there. Obviously, if I was to see myself represented in a game as some blatant stereotype, obviously it's going to kind of aggravate me or whatever. And so when firms like this exist, I think at best it's when, hey, they're actually out there to write well-meaning human characters, right? But obviously looking at their past tweets and some of the people's past statements, it really feels like, again, there is a divisive rift in there, right? Like, again, you can't have inclusion when you are actually demonizing or chastising people of one specific race over the other, right? We've made a lot of progress, right? In civil rights and in race relations in like the last several decades. And to see these people kind of have like an elementary view of that, of human beings and the interpersonal relationships we have, I think that's what insults the 
vast majority. And are there people that obviously are like, I'm not going to play that game because I don't like that character and their skin color. Yeah, we make fun of that, okay? We call those people idiots. Uh, giving them any form of, like, validity or even thinking about what they say is just feeding a troll. But yeah, when I talk about well-meaning characters, that's literally what I'm on about. Now, the reason why people were looking into this company as well, too, is that there's been a bit of a there's been a bit of a link to uh, something known as ESG. Now, obviously, why would a big AAA publisher or like indie games or like a company outsource to some people like this or, or a company that works in, in you know, uh, diversity, so to speak, uh, or inclusive writing? And that's because of something that is known as ESG. So to give you an idea, uh, diversity, uh, inclu equity, and inclusiveness, this is a term that is used, DEI, and of course it has a link to something known as ESG. So for instance, uh, when it comes to dog whistle diversity, right, this is actually a criticism of the situation, uh, what, it, what it effectively happened was dog whistle diversity is defined as the hiring of groups, uh, and you can I guess replace that with, I guess, inclusiveness of different groups for video games, uh, who have historically been underrepresented or subject to discrimination by organizations for the social aspect of environmental, social, and corporate governance, which is known as ESG. To investors and stakeholders, hiring these groups sends a coded message that the organization is more open to a diverse workforce. But to the groups hired, it suggests the organization lacks effective diversity management or inclusion. So obviously it's just designed to be window dressing, right? Like if you write these inclusive stories for investors who are putting money into these big game companies, they'll think, oh yeah, this is a pretty progressive, like, you know, sustainable, uh, thoughtful company. We'll put money into it. But for the people that are being represented, you know, POCs, people like me or whatever, right? Like if you just write a, uh, you know, a generic Indian person for the sake of hitting that check mark, it's not really going to do much for me in the grand scheme of the social issues and the social awareness I want to raise about my kind out there. It's just designed to be window dressing for, you know, corporate points. And so the link that it has, ESG, there's actually a definition on Investopedia about this, right? So ESG, for anybody that doesn't know, is an essential tool for investors to assess the company's sustainability and ethical performance. Ethical performance being the more important thing over here because we're talking about diversity, right? Which is the S in the ESG score. So an ESG score is kind of like, the best way to put it is like, you know how you have a credit score, right? Like, this is how good I am financially in the world. What an ESG score is, again, it evaluates for how effective a company is, zero to 100, on environmental issues, social issues like labor practices, pro-diversity efforts, human rights, community relations, health and safety, governance issues. On a surface level, it's not necessarily the most evil thing in the world because it's just a score that shows you like, hey, these companies are relatively good uh, ethical companies, all right? Hey, this is a weapons manufacturer that pretty much employs some of the worst practices around the world and their entire business is dedicated to like creating weapons of mass destruction, so to speak. They probably get a low ESG score. Versus like a company that I guess is historically or traditionally doing good in the eyes of these organizations and they get, I guess, a good score. And obviously there's a few ESG rating companies, kind of like the Equifax of this entire situation. So this is like the Bloomberg ESG, the Dow Jones Sustainability Indexes, the Sustainalytics, uh, Refinitiv, S&P Global, CDP scores, so on and so forth. So for instance, if you want to look up like the ESG score of a company like, I don't know, Apple, for instance, right? A trending ticker at the moment. What you do is you go to like the, uh, the Yahoo Finance uh, website, you go to the sustainability tab and you can see that this is their like ESG score. So they're like 17 and they've got a significant controversy level. They're actually low. So Apple, regardless of all its grandstanding is rated pretty low on the ESG score. And of course, this ESG score has some effect on the actual stock price itself and the investor's perception of a good company. At least that's what I've learned over here. So generally, again, to round it all back, the reason why people have been looking at Sweet Baby Inc. is their involvement in a lot of these projects, which for the gamers who are boycotting it, appears to be pretty harmful uh, in terms of the writing quality for some of these games, also that these companies can have more diversity, equity, and inclusion so they can raise their ESG scores and look more palatable for actual investors in the gaming industry. That's pretty much the general understanding and the general you know, story that is being pushed by some of these groups out here. Now look, at the end of the day, I think that for a lot of the games that Sweet Baby Inc. has worked with, and again, to go back to their projects, there have been a lot of successful hitters like God of War Ragnarok, Alan Wake 2, 
Um, Spider-Man 2 seems to have gotten pretty relatively great reviews. Obviously, they've got one game in this list here that is absolutely despised by individuals. And again, it's hard to say how much uh, Sweet Baby Inc. has worked with some of these games entirely. I think it's absolutely a very, very, very key thing to talk about some of their members, some of the higher ranking members, making those rather off-color tweets in general. Now, of course, ladies and gentlemen, Kotaku jumped in and made an article saying Sweet Baby Inc. doesn't do what some gamers think it does. No, one company is enforcing diversity into all your favorite games. So again, right in this article, one of the things they talk about is Sweet Baby Inc. is enforcing diversity. It's happening naturally, they say. So inside here, what they say is, though these kind of social media posts argue that companies like Sweet Baby Inc., because remember, they're not the only company that works in uh, diversity consulting, somehow force game studios to include diverse characters and storyline, the reality is vastly different. Sweet Baby Inc. is a narratively narrative design company, meaning most of its work is focused on writing stories and dialogue. They are not a DEI consultancy firm. So again, when they mention this specific sentence right over here, it actually is contradicted by the website itself. I mean, the website says it's founded in 2018. It is a narrative development and consultation studio based in Montreal and working around the globe. Our mission is to tell better, more empathetic stories while diversifying and enriching the video game industry. We aim to make games more engaging, more fun, more meaningful, and more inclusive for everyone. I mean, that literally does sound like the definition of a DEI consultancy firm in regard regards to video games. So even the mass gaming media public out here, right, the mass publications are out there trying to downplay or outright make, in my opinion, improper statements about this situation. So yeah, it's a weird thing to witness. And this is, I guess, what's actually aggravating individuals out there. It almost feels incredibly condescending to anybody that has basic reading skills. A lot of individuals say this is like Gamergate 2.0. And at the end of the day, all I'm seeing is a group of people who want to vote with their wallet and basically create a list of games that they don't want to support because they're associated with this company, which again, in a free market, you're absolutely allowed to do. So yeah, Sweet Baby Inc. Uh, are they totally responsible for some of the bad games out there? Again, nobody knows to the degree of what they worked on. And honestly, some of these games that people are criticizing, like the Kill the Justice League nonsense, isn't necessarily bad just because of its writing. It's bad because it's a crap tier live service game and there ain't no writing or ESG uh, outsourcing that ever had anything to do with that nonsense. But yeah, honestly, I can't say that I quite enjoy this company reading some of what their leadership has written on their Twitter accounts um, is alarming. It really is. And for companies like this, I don't mind if there's a DEI company out there, but if you're going to be inclusive and you're going to focus on equity, Instead of dividing our people even further, maybe we should all focus on, you know, bringing us together versus, again, all, the, all those tweets did was serve to divide individuals. And that's where this division is coming from. And it's not something I am ever comfortable ever seeing. And that's pretty much where I'm going to leave things off of. Ladies and gentlemen, let me know what you think about this in the comment section below. And hey, if you want to try uh, one up our brand new skin cream. The link is in the description below. Ladies and gentlemen, this is me, Mudahar, and if you like what you saw, please like, comment, and subscribe. Dislike if you dislike it. I am out.